as uh, the integral over the set A for all the particles of my density function. That's here. And this is uh, standard trickery of the Andrea formula to, to move these integrals inside the, um, inside the determinant. And I can write this in, in, an, in a compact form like this. So, um, so this, sorry, I can write each term of this big sum in a compact form like this. So uh, just a determinant of, and then in each entry, there's a integral q to the uh, some power, and then integral of these Hermite functions. Okay. Okay, so now I have a big sum of determinants that look like this. It looks a little bit better. Uh, and if I introduce an operator, m, which is an integral operator whose kernel is an infinite sum of Hermite functions weighted by q. So it's a relatively simple, simple operator. I'll take that operator and I'll expand its Fredholm determinant, uh, determinant of 1 plus z times m times the indi indicator function on a. Um, what I see when I expand that Fredholm determinant is exactly these terms uh, which are written in the, um, sorry, exactly the sum which is written up here. So, uh, so the observation is that the, the expansion of this Fredholm determinant in z is exactly uh, given by 1 plus z. Okay, there's a, uh, I need to cancel this uh, q Pockhammer symbol, so I'll divide by that. But times this, uh, the probability that in the model with one particle, that particle is in A. And in the next term, in the model with two particles, both of them are in A, et cetera. Okay. So, okay, those are exactly what I'm looking for. Those are the, um, the gap probabilities. And so if I want to know the gap probability for n particles, I just need to pick out the nth term in that sum, which you can do by, uh, by integrating around, around the origin. Um, so I integrate around the origin dz divided by z to the n plus 1. That'll pick out the, the nth term. So um, that's a formula for the gap probability. That's not the one that I had on the earlier slide. So it turns out this one somehow is not so convenient for asymptotic analysis. Um, so the formula that I had on the board uh, involved a different kernel. It's similar. It's still an infinite sum of these Hermite functions, but weighted by something a little more complicated. Uh, so how can I go from m to k? Well, uh, the observation that we made was that if I take, actually this is an identity of operators, so I only care about the determinant, but this is really an identity of operators. If I take uh, this operator, i plus z times m times a characteristic function on a, that's the same as uh, i plus z times m on the whole real line, no characteristic function, times i minus k on the complement of a. So you multiply that out. Uh, the proof isn't too hard to see that, that, uh, that this is an equality of operators. And then if you have an equality of operators, then the determinants are the same. Uh, now, the determinant, uh, which is i plus z times m on the whole real line, is very simple to compute because I'll go back to m. Yeah, here's m. So uh, if I take i plus z times m on the whole real line, it's diagonalized by, um, by these Hermite functions, exactly. And, and that determinant is exactly a uh, product of 1 plus z times q to the k, which is this uh, q Pockhammer symbol. So, so this is what we do. We just take this determinant here, replace it with uh, this one down here, and that turns out to give us a formula which is, which is nicer for asymptotic analysis. Now, uh, that was a relatively simple observation, um, but then uh, Dong noticed that since similar formulas are showing up in these McDonald processes and other types of interacting particle systems, maybe the, this kind of identity of Fredholm determinants could be useful uh, in other models. So, 
So let me generalize that identity of Fred Holm determinants. So I'm going to maybe switch gears, not talk about the free fermion model, and talk a little abstractly about these, uh, uh, about these Fred Holm determinants and, and operators. So, OK, suppose I have, uh, before I had Hermite functions, but suppose I have any biorthogonal system on uh, some contour in the complex plane. So before my contour was just the real line, but I can take any comp contour, I'll call it gamma. Uh, so phi's and psi's are, are orthogonal uh, on this contour, biorthogonal on this, on this contour. And now let me define kernels analogous to, to what we saw before. So m is just the sum of phi times psi weighted by q. And k is the sum of phi times psi weighted by this, uh, this rational expression involving q and z. OK, and there's corresponding integral operators, uh, bold m and bold k. Then we have exactly the same result as we had before. So if I take gamma and I cut it into two pieces, gamma 1 and gamma 2, then the result is that uh, the Fred Holm, or sorry, this is operator identity. So the operator i plus uh, z times m, yeah, probably uh, my notation is bad here. I'm sorry. When I'm talking about operators, I should, I should write a characteristic function there. So, so replace that L2 with a characteristic function, a chi. Uh, a chi. Um, so i plus z times m on the, the first piece, gamma 1, is the same as i plus z on the big piece, gamma, times i minus k on the remaining piece, gamma 2. So that's, again, an identity of, of operators. And if we take determinants, then I find okay, the determinant of i plus z on L2 of the one contour is the same as i plus z times m on the big contour, i minus k. Uh, on the uh, remaining contour. And again, since I have a biorthogonal system, the determinant on the big contour is easy. It's exactly the same uh, Q Pockhammer infinite uh, product. And then I'm left with a determinant on the other contour. So, uh, so this gives us some kind of a way to change if I have a determinant on one contour and maybe I don't like that contour very much, then maybe I can switch it to, to another one. So as an example, um, can consider the, the QTACEP. So that's a, an interacting particle system, um, which particles are on the uh, integer lattice, and they can jump to the right uh, at random. And the rate at which they jump is, uh, is determined by the, the gap between particles. So if there's a big gap, then they tend to jump faster. If there's a small gap, they don't jump. If there's no gap, then they can't jump at all. So there's that exclusion. Um, OK, whoops. So, um, so that's one of the models that, uh, that showed up in, in uh, Corwin and Borden's uh, McDonald process paper. Uh, and they give several formulas for uh, this certain observable in the model, which is uh, it's some kind of a Q moment generating function for the, uh, for the position of the nth particle. So actually, this formula I read from uh, a, a later paper with Sasamoto. Um, so this is their formula. So um, we're interested in the location of the nth particle. That's the, so I'm, I should say the particles are, are uh, starting all to the, on the, uh, negative part of the real line. So they're packed. So this is step initial condition. And I'm nth is the nth from the, uh, nth from the origin. OK, so this is their formula. Um, so it has this q hammer type factor. And then there's a determinant, uh, which I can write as i plus z times m. And the contour is any contour which encloses um, OK, there's n positive numbers here, which are the jump rates for the first n particles. So the, the jump rates depend on the distance, but they also depend on some uh, independent parameter. 
So we'll call those A1 through AN. Um, and this contour is supposed to include zero and also uh, all of these positive numbers A. And the kernel for M, okay, it looks a little complicated maybe, but it can be written as some function of the first variable, xi, divided by xi minus q times the second variable, eta. Okay. And that doesn't look much like the m that we had on a previous slide, but uh, if I assume that uh, the ratio of the xi and the eta is smaller than uh, 1 over q, which is true for certain contours, then you can expand this as a geometric series. And I can write, if I expand as a geometric series, I get, um, I get an expansion like this. So there's a q to the k, there's a phi of uh, xi, there's a psi of eta, and I just have to pick these uh, phi and psi to be appropriate things. So I pick the phi to be exactly that f times an appropriate power of xi, and the psi function is just a power of eta. So, um, so the contour uh, that we're talking about is, is the big one here, the big, big uh, solid one on the outside, which encloses all of the A's and also zero. Um, then it's not so hard to see. Uh, this function f satisfies f of zero is one, which means that the psi and the phi functions actually do form a biorthogonal system uh, on that contour. Okay, just, just the, the Cauchy theorem tells you that. So we have a, a, a kernel M, which can be written in the form that we like, expansion of biorthogonal system um, weighted by Q. So we can try to apply our theorem and see if it helps. Um, so I need to think about this big contour as part of uh, an even bigger contour with, on which the phi and the psi are orthogonal. So what, what I can do is think about the, take the big one and add to it uh, this, well, yeah, so I can think about the dotted contour, I guess. So the dotted contour has a big contour and then it has another dotted contour on the inside which is uh, the opposite orientation. So what do those do? They don't enclose uh, the A's, they will just enclose zero. And that's exactly the, uh, what I'll call gamma. So gamma is the dotted contour here. Okay. And then gamma decomposes into two parts. Gamma one is the, uh, yeah, ga or sorry, this is the notation I use. Gamma zero comma A is the big one that encloses zero and A, and gamma just A is the one that just encloses the the, uh, the A's, these positive numbers. So, um, so now we just apply this identity of Fredholm determinants. The original determinant was this one, I plus Z times M on uh, the contour enclosing everything. Now, uh, all right, so that should be the same as the determinant um, of I plus Z times M on, uh, on the, the union of these two contours, which are oriented in opposite directions, times the determinant of I, plus, I minus K on the uh, smaller contour that only encloses the A's. And once again, I get my pock hammer. I get uh, then, okay, I reverse the orientation, so I minus K becomes I plus K. Um, and I have a different kernel now and a different contour. And so this gives us, okay, an alternative uh, formulation of this moment generating function. And what's this k now? Well, I just use my formula for the k. Um, so it can be expanded in the phi and the psi with these prefactors. And, okay, you can notice if you uh, look at some books on hypergeometric functions that this is, is actually a basic hypergeometric function. So there's an explicit prefactor times basic hypergeometric function with okay, certain, certain values for the parameters. Um, so 
Okay, that's nice, but what's really nice is that there's a contour integral formula for that hypergeometric function. So, um, so in the end, we have a kernel that looks something like this. Uh, there's a very similar kernel for, this, uh, for the same object, which appears um, in the uh, borden corwin uh, McDonald processes paper, but it's not exactly the same. And it's not clear uh, to me um, if this might be easier for asymptotic analysis. Now, in this particular example, uh, the asymptotic analysis has been done, probably by people sitting in this room. Um, but the point was just to, to show how um, this simple identity can, can give different formulas uh, for these uh, determinantal type formulas, which in some cases may be more useful uh, than what's, what's are out there already. So uh, the process is very similar for at least what's called the Q Whitaker processes and possibly, possibly beyond. So I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so, uh, so what now? So if one thing <laughs> that we're asking is, um, is this Fred Holm determinant identity useful for asymptotics in, in any other models? Um, I think the answer is yes, but I have to look and see. Um, back to the free fermion model. Okay, we gave results in one dimension. You can ask about higher dimensions, which was done in the physical setting by, by the DDMS group last year. Um, but I don't know of any, um, any other uh, mathematical results. The, we do, I think, lose contact with random matrix theory in higher dimension. I don't think there's any random matrix interpretation of, say, two-dimensional free fermions. Um, what else? Uh, in these canonical ensemble and the grand canonical ensemble of this MNS model, uh, we saw that the local statistics are the same. So somehow in the large limit, the local statistics are the same, which is to be expected. Uh, but it's another question, what about non-local statistics? So um, for the grand canonical ensemble, uh, there's recent work by Johansson and, and Lambert. Um, and they found, so they considered uh, temperature as a parameter, but also the scaling for the, limit, for the linear statistics. So in some uh, mesoscopic scaling, uh, they found that there's some re regime. You can tune those two parameters, temperature and uh, the, the mesoscopic scaling, in which there uh, is non-Gaussian fluctuations for the linear statistics. So at low temperature, the, they find just random matrix type linear statistics. At high temperature, they find the usual central limit theorem. But in between, there seems to be something non-Gaussian. Um, and as I understand, it doesn't seem to be a universal uh, transition between those two. But you could still ask, OK, maybe it's not universal uh, distribution, but are th is there anything universal about it? Are there any universal properties to it? Um, so they did linear statistics in the grand canonical ensemble, and actually a little more general. Um, what about in the canonical ensemble? So there, there's less uh, results that I know of. There's a recent paper of Yasek Grela, Majumdar, and Sher, uh, in which they consider uh, some specific type of linear statistics. Uh, but for the canonical ensemble, there's still lots of open questions. So in particular, um, do linear statistics, should we expect that the canonical and grand canonical ensembles will agree uh, in the linear statistics? Um, and then finally, uh, just a, a very recent paper, which was on the archive two weeks ago, um, by uh, Kundin, Mizadri, and O'Connell. Um, they gave some interpretation of free fermions on an interval with various symmetries. Uh, they interpret it as finite temperature version of the uh, random matrices, random, uh, random matrices associated with classical compact groups. Uh, so that's another direction. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what to do with that, but it, it's very interesting, and I just wanted to point it out. So that's all. Thank you very much. Questions? So 
So I have a question. Um, for this crossover distribution that you got mm -hmm. for the largest one, what sort of tail uh, estimates do you know, or can you use the matrix models to establish some? Oh, good question. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, is Satya here? He probably knows better. Do you know the, the tails of this crossover distribution? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so let's thank Carl again. And we'll start in a few minutes, uh, three minutes. <laughs>